Now we're going to move on to chapter 14, which is the digestive system. This is another very large chapter, so I will be breaking the chapter into two recordings. So again, you want to make sure that you listen to both recordings. All right, as with past chapters, we have some objectives. So again, just you should be used to it by this. By chapter 14, you should be pretty used to this by now. You want to make sure that you have listened to both lectures and read the chapter in your book, and then you want to come back and answer all these objectives so that you have a clear understanding of what the chapter covered. All right, the alimentary canal, or the GI tract. This is a continuous, hollow, muscular tube. And you have several organs, mouth, pharynx, which is the back of the throat, uh, esophagus, stomach, small and large intestines. So here in the picture, you can see all those organs that we just talked about. All right, let's start with the mouth. This is the oral cavity. You are ingesting food. You've got lips, cheek, palate, uvula, which is that thing that hangs down in the back of your throat, your tongue, the tonsils, and the lingual frenulum. The lingual frenulum is that little piece of tissue that anchors the tongue to the bottom of your mouth. You also have the pharynx, which is a passageway where peristalsis begins. Peristalsis is the movement of food through the digesti digestive tract. It's basically here you're going to learn in a few minutes that the GI tract is lined with smooth muscle. And that smooth muscle will alternate contractions, thus propelling the food through the esophagus and stomach and small and large intestines. So that's all peristalsis. Now, peristalsis starts in the pharynx, and that's also where the four layers of the GI tract begin, which we're going to talk about here in just a few minutes. Now, you have the oro and laryngopharynx and nasopharynx. Nasopharynx is the back of the nose. Oropharynx is the back of the throat. And then laryngopharynx is toward the back, but further down where the larynx is. The esophagus, also called the gullet, is the passageway um, where peristalsis continues, and then it goes from the mouth to the stomach. Okay, let's talk about those four layers of the GI tract. Again, they start at the pharynx, and they run all the way to the anus. You have the mucosa, which is the innermost layer. It's moist and resists friction. Then you have the submucosa, which is where you're going to find all the blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatics. And then the third is a muscularis externa. This is that smooth muscle that causes peristalsis. And then the outer is a serosa, or that peritoneum. Okay, let's start off with the mucosa. That's the innermost layer, and its big thing, of course, is mucus. It has an epithelial lining with goblet cells that is going to secrete mucus to protect the organs from being digested by enzymes. You have the lamina propria, which is made of areolar connective tissue. Here, the capillaries nourish and absorb nutrients, and this is also where you find that malt lymph nodes, the mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue. Then you have something called the muscularis mucosa, which is a very small amount of smooth muscle that dislodges any food that gets stuck in the mucus. And it also produces villi in the small intestines to increase surface area. A common mistake is you see that muscularis, which means muscle, and you think, oh, that's the one that causes peristalsis. But no, this is a very tiny, tiny amount of smooth muscle, and it only dislodges stuck food and mucus. That's it, not peristalsis. So the major functions here are secrete mucus, some enzymes and hormones, and then absorption of the digested products into the blood. So this is literally where the absorption occurs. The submucosal layer is made of dense connective tissue, and this is where you find all the blood vessels, lymphatics, and nerves. It functions to supply the GI tract with nutrients. Remember, the GI tract are organs as well, so they need their own blood supply and nutrients, and this is a layer that will do that. It also has some elastic fibers to allow for recoiling. Now, the next layer 
is the muscularis externa. This is that thick smooth muscle layer that functions in segmentation, which is mixing, and peristalsis, which is the propelling of food through the GI tract. It can also act as sphincters to prevent backflow of food. The outermost layer is the serosa, which is the visceral peritoneum, which remember is one of the serous membranes. Now, it's made of areolar connective tissue and covered with a little bit of squamous epithelia. Now, adventitia is the fibrous connective tissue that covers the esophagus and retroperitoneal organs, which means those are the organs not covered by the peritoneum. All right, so if we look here, you can see the innermost lining, again, is the mucosal. Then you've got that thin muscle layer that dislodges the food stuck in the mucus. Then you've got the submucosal layer where all the blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatics are. Then you have the muscularis externa, which is the thick, smooth muscle that causes peristalsis. And then finally, you're out into the peritoneum. Now, the enteric nervous system. Enteric just means gut. These are the neurons that regulate digestive system activity. You have the intrinsic nerve plexuses in the walls of the alimentary or GI tract. You have two nerve plexuses. You have the submucosal nerve plexus and the myenteric. The submucosal will control the mucus production that um, small layer of smooth muscle to dislodge food stuck in mucus where the myenteric will control the smooth muscle that causes peristalsis. So here you can see the myenteric nerve plexus. Again, you'll see that in that muscularis externa, as in yellow, and then the submucosal nerve plexus in yellow on the submucosal layer. All right, the stomach is C-shaped. Food enters via the cardioesophageal sphincter, which you can see in the picture below. The fundus is the expanded part of the stomach. The pylorus is the terminal part or the end where the chyme exits via the pyloric sphincter to the small intestines. Now, gastric glands will secrete gastric juice with enzymes to aid in digestion. All right, let's take a look at that word chyme. All right, food is only called food in our mouth. Once we swallow it, we call it a bolus. Once that bolus hits the stomach and starts mixing with all that gastric juice, we call it chyme. And it'll stay that term for a while. All right, so let's look at the microscopic anatomy of, stru um, microscopic anatomy of the stomach. All right, so the stomach is part of the GI tract, so it has those four layers that we just discussed. But what it's done is it's added a specialization to those layers. So it still has the four, but now we're actually adding a third muscle layer to the muscularis externa. This allows for the churning and mixing that's required in the stomach. So we call this layer the oblique layer. So still have the four, we just added an extra muscular layer because of the requirements of the stomach. Now, the mucosa is made of simple columnar epithelium. You've got lots of goblet cells to produce protective mucus. Okay, we've got hydrochloric acid. We've got digestive enzymes. We've got a lot of things that could potentially eat the stomach away. So the mucus helps protect the lining. Now, gastritis is an inflammation of that stomach wall. It's been irritated. Gastric ulcer is an erosion of the stomach wall. Helicobacter pylori. This is uh, a bacteria that is reoccurring. It is hard to get rid of. I mean, it's ridiculously hard to get rid of. You'll have people on antibiotics eight months to a year to get rid of this. That's almost unheard of. And, and then it just pops back up. For years, probably the last 30 years, we've attributed most ulcers to this Helicobacter pylori. But there are other things that cause ulcers as well, like alcohol, smoking, coffee, and stress. All increase the acidity of the stomach, making it easier for ulcers to form. Now, all the new research points to aspirin being the most common cause of ulcers today. Now, 
I'm sure if you go back in your textbook, it says that Helicobacter pylori is still that. But it's wrong. And, you know, your book was written by a very smart person, but not a lot of clinical experience. And so this is where that kind of pays off. And honestly, this is where cardiologists and gastroenterologists will argue. Because cardiologists want you to take a baby aspirin every day. And that, of course, remember, reduces blood volume, prevents clotting. A baby aspirin is only 81 milligrams. But in our society of I can do better, what ends up happening is people go, oh, if a baby aspirin will help me, I bet an adult aspirin will super help me. No, no, that is not the case. Because your body, your stomach more importantly, can deal with baby aspirin on a daily basis because of the low milligrams. And it still functions with the clot problem. An adult aspirin is 250 or higher milligrams. And no, you're not, your stomach is not set up for that. So what you end up happening <clears throat> is people end up taking all these aspirins, which includes other things like ibuprofen is hard on the stomach, your BC, your goodie powders, all of those will eat up your stomach. Now, you also have gastric pits. This is the location of the gastric glands that are going to produce the gastric juice, which contains hydrochloric acid, HCL. All right, here you can see the gastric ulcers. In the upper left-hand corner picture, that is an actual ulcer. That's a hole in the stomach wall. To the right is a scar left from a healed ulcer. All right, stomach physiology. Food stimulates the release of gastric juice. Heartburn is gastric juice that backs up into the esophagus, which is not protected with mucus. So any of that hydrochloric acid can easily eat away that esophagus. Now, hydrochloric acid keeps pH low. Mucus protects the walls of the stomach from the acid. We already talked about the ulcer. Uh, acidic pH, however, is required for enzymes like pepsin to work. Remember, enzymes are proteins that require a specific pH to work. If you didn't have that low pH, pepsin wouldn't work there. Now, vomiting or emesis is an irritation which activates the emectic center in the medulla oblongata. The muscles contract and the pressure increases and you vomit. Now, more on that microscopic anatomy. You have gastric glands. Now, we're going to talk about all the cells found there. You have the mucus neck cells, which add acidic mucus, the parietal cells, which secrete intrinsic factor. Now, this is required for life. So this is essential. You cannot live without intrinsic factor because intrinsic factor is required for your body to be able to absorb vitamin B12, and we can't live without vitamin B12. Now, also the parietal cells secrete hydrochloric acid. And hydrochloric acid will kill microorganisms and activate pepsin and denature other proteins. The chief cells produce pepsinogen, which is an inactive form of pepsin. Then pepsin gets activated, converts pepsinogen to pepsin through a positive feedback. The enteroendocrine cells are the ones that are going to be releasing your hormones. So here in the picture, we can see a gastric pit. And you can see the purple are the chief cells. The enteroendocrine are at the bottom in green. And then the parietal cells are in blue. All right, now we're going to move into the small intestines. All right, the small intestines runs from the pyloric sphincter to the ileocecal valve. It is the longest part of the GI tract and the major digestive organ. 90% of all absorption occurs in the small intestines. That is its major function. So digestion here can take three to six hours. Now, there are three subdivisions to the small intestines. You have the first about 10 inches is called the duodenum. This is the shortest part of the intestine. It wraps around the head of the pancreas. Food is going to enter here from the stomach. This is where the bile and pancreatic duct 
empty into. So the bile duct is going to be coming from the gallbladder or liver, and then the pancreatic duct, of course, is coming from the pancreas. Both of these are releasing secretions required for digestion. The middle part of the small intestines is called the jejunum, and then the last part, the end, about 12 feet, is the ileum, and that runs up to the ileocecal valve where it joins the large intestines. Alright, here you can see the liver is the big brown organ, and then the green organ is the gallbladder. Now, what you can see is that you have this first part of the small intestines, which is the duodenum, and then you can see the pancreas. The purpose of this picture is to show you that the bile duct and the pancreatic duct both empty into this duodenum. Okay, so let's talk about those tunics again. All right, so you still have the four tunics or layers, but now we've added or modified some of them based on the special needs of the small intestines. For example, you have circular folds of the mucosa and submucosal layer. This forces that acidic chyme to spiral through the lumen, thus slowing it down, uh, I mean, a lot. And, and the purpose of it going slower is because, again, this is where 90% of your absorption takes place. So you don't want the chyme booking it through and then you not having time to absorb any nutrients. You want it to take its time so that you can pull as much nutrients out as possible. You also have villi here. Okay, anytime you hear the word villi, it's always to increase surface area, and, and that's what it's doing here. These are projections of the mucosa that increase surface area. They contain lacteals, which are lymph capillaries, and blood capillaries. Again, the villi is to increase surface area so you can get more absorption, more nutrients. You have microvilli, which are plasma membrane projections. Those are going to contain brush border enzymes for both carb and protein digestion. We also find the pyre patches here. Remember, we talked about these back in Chapter uh, 12 in the immune system. This is lymph tissue found in the submucosal layer. Helps prevent the bad bacteria of intestines from escaping into the body cavity. All right, here you can see, this is the small intestines, you can see those circular folds to slow the food movement through, and you can see the villi to add surface area. All right, this is looking at the villi itself and seeing what's inside of it. Okay, remember you have the green lacteal. That's going to be for fat absorption. And then you have the blood capillary. That's for everything else to be absorbed. All right, small intestines physiology. This secretes protective mucus. You've got brush border enzymes, which are going to break down proteins and sugars. You have pancreatic juices, will increase the pH and break down foods, especially fats or lipids. Bile mechanically breaks down fat. Now, mechanically is different from chemical. Okay, so first, and we talk about this later on. But first, when fat enters the small intestines, bile has to mechanically, so physically, mush it up so that then it can be chemically broken down. And of course, the villi provide that increased surface area for absorption. One of the major, major, major things happening in the small intestines is you are reversing the acidity of the stomach. Because you got to think, that stomach was, I mean, it's, it's highly, it's got like a pH of 2. It's really acidic. So, so is that chyme when it enters the small intestines. Small intestines is not set up for that type of acidity. You don't have all those extra mucus protective layers. So you can easily eat that away. So you have hormones and chemicals that are all going to be secreted to help increase that pH, again, preventing the small intestines from being eaten. All right, large intestines. This has a large diameter, but it's actually quite short. It runs from the ileocecal valve to the anus. It, its major function is to absorb any water that is left, which dries out any indigestible food. Now, your subdivisions, you have the cecum is the first part. The appendix comes off of that. And then the colon, you have ascending, transverse, and descending colon which leads to the rectum and then finally the anal canal. 
There are no villi, but there are a large number of goblet cells that produce mucus. All right, so in this picture, we can go to the bottom left, and we see the cecum, which is C-shaped, and there's the appendix coming off. Then you go into the ascending, transverse, and descending colon. Now, the sigmoid colon is this last little loop up, then you're into the rectum, and then out the anal canal. All right, the large intestines receives water, indigestibles, and bacteria from the small intestines. The bacteria release gases that give feces odor. The absorption is limited to vitamins, ions, and water. That's it. You are not absorbing any food anymore, like nutrients like that. The only thing that's happening in the large intestines is absorbing vitamins, ions, and water. Now you get mass movements that will occur three to four times a day. They're slow, powerful contraction waves moving contents to the rectum. The defecation reflex, that's a spinal reflex to stretched walls that cause the rectum contraction and anal sphincter relaxation. So basically, as the in large intestines fills, it triggers off a reflex that tells you it's time to empty. Now, your imbalances, diarrhea. That is where food has rushed through the large intestines. You did not have time to absorb the water like you should have. The problem is you're also going to lose ions and fluids, which then could lead to dehydration. Constipation is the flip side. Here you went too slow through the large intestine, so too much water was reabsorbed. This is typically due to a lack of fiber in your diet. Fiber or bulk increases the strength of contractions and softens your stool. Appendicitis. That's an inflammation of the appendix from blockage trapping bacteria. Swelling cuts off the blood supply, killing the cells. Rupturing sprays feces with bacteria into the abdomen, which then leads to peritonitis. Now, we typically go ahead and remove the appendix, even if it's just inflamed, because we want it, we do not want it to get to the point where it ruptures. And, and you can live without your appendix. It doesn't, it's one of those vestigial. It doesn't really do anything anymore. The diverticula. All right, these are small herniations of the mucosa layer through the colon wall. And it's due to a lack of bulk in the diet. And then contractions put pressure on those walls. Now, diverticulosis is the forming of the diverticula. Diverticulitis you can die from. That's an inflamed diverticula. And if it ruptures, it most definitely could be deadly. All right, here you can see on the bottom left, that's a portion of the large intestines that had to be removed due to excessive diverticula. That's all those little bumps and pockets that you're seeing there. That, that's ridiculous. That's way too much. And over here in the picture on the top right, you can see this is a diverticula. That's part of that mucosa lining popping out from straining. Now, the concern is when now food's going to get stuck in those, and then when you go to strain to defecate, it's going to cause it to rupture, and then all that feces and bacteria that enters the sterile peritoneal cavity, and you can easily die. People do not understand how much you need fiber. Okay, now I'm 36. Uh, I'm I'm young. One of the things that I think you should really, really think about is fiber because most people in my age group are younger we're not worried about fiber it's grandma and grandpa you got to worry about fiber but no no you need to worry about this now so that you don't have to deal with these types of problems later on in life so and it's just a little bit of extra fiber and there's so many ways you can get fiber now you don't have to if you don't like your vegetables fine drink a v8 or if you don't like that they have little fiber chocolate pills now you can take or metamucil or i mean there's so many ways that you can get your fiber intake now all right accessory digestive organs you have salivary glands you have the parotid which is the larger the submandibular which is the smaller now, saliva is mucus and your serous fluids. It contains the enzyme salivary amylase. Now, you have lysosomes and antibodies, and the purpose is to moisten and help form the bolus, which remembers food when we swallow it.
Mumps is an inflamed, parotid salivary gland. Teeth. You, uh, the purpose of teeth is to masticate, which means chew and grind food. So this is a mechanical digestion. You have deciduous teeth, which are your baby teeth, also called milk teeth. There are 20 of those. Then they fall out, and you get your permanent teeth, which are your adult teeth. And there are 32 of those. Now, some uh, accessory digestive organs. Moving on to the pancreas. These... Uh, their big thing is to neutralize that acidic chyme entering the small intestines. Now, you also have pancreatic enzymes that will be used to um, digest. Well, let's see. You've got pancreatic amylase. Amylase is going to be digesting carbs. And we'll talk about some other things that it's working on. But nonetheless, it neutralizes the chyme and it produces enzymes for digestion. The liver is the largest gland of the body. It produces bile emulsifies fat, um, no enzymes. Now, it produces the bile, but it doesn't store it. The gallbladder stores the bile when you're not digesting it. It doesn't make it, but it does store it. Gallstones. This is where bile is stored for too long. You get too much water removed. The cholesterol crystallizes, causes pain when the gallbladder contracts. Um, you can have this removed if we can't, if you can't, uh, we can try to laser some of the gallstones, but if, if you do have your gallbladder removed because of excessive stones or it's not functioning properly, then what will happen is the bile duct that goes from the liver will then be the only place you can store bile since the gallbladder will be gone. Um, that really means that you need to be backing off your fat intake considerably, okay? Why? Well, because remember, bile is what mechanically digests fats. So, if you don't have this extra bile, then you don't need to be consuming as many fats. Jaundice. This is where you have bile in the bloodstream. You get a yellow skin color, and this is typically due to blockage of either the hepatic or the bile ducts, uh, which can be caused by hepatitis, cirrhosis of the liver. There, there's several of these reasonings. All right, in this picture, you can see what a gallbladder looks like full of gallstones. In the bottom left-hand picture, you can actually see two very large ones sitting next to a cell phone. You can kind of get the idea of just how massive they can get. All right, which of the following structures functions to absorb nutrients from digested materials? Is it A, stomach, B, small intestines, C, large intestines, or D, esophagus? And the answer is B, small intestines. Now, which layer of the alimentary canal or GI tract is responsible for peristalsis? Is it A, submucosa, B, serosa, C, mucosa, or D, muscularis externa? And the answer would be D, the muscularis externa. All right, the overall functions of the digestive system, of course, you're ingesting, that's taking in food, digesting, both chemically and physically breaking down, absorbing nutrients, and then defecating out the remains. There are two major groups. You have the alimentary canal, or the GI tract, and then the accessory digestive organs, which are not part of the GI tract, but they are required or essential for digestion. So an example of an accessory digestive organ, we just kind of did. That would be like the pancreas and the liver and the gallbladder. All right, so ingestion. This is food coming in the mouth, chewing, and then, of course, saliva is released as a reflex to the food. Propulsion. That is the peristalsis, which, remember, is the involuntary waves or contractions that moves the food through the GI tract. Remember, this starts at the pharynx and goes all the way to the anus. Now, you also have segmentation, which is the contraction to mix the food. It may propel it a little, but not a lot. Now, if you look to the pictures to the right, the top picture is showing the peristalsis, the propelling of food through the GI tract. The bottom picture is showing that segmentation or mixing. And, of course, deglutition is swallowing of food. 
mechanical digestion is physically moving things. So like mixing with the tongue, chewing with the teeth, segmentation. Chemical digestion is the breakdown by enzymes. We're going to take those macromolecules and we're going to break them down to their monomers, their individual building blocks so that we can absorb them. So absorption is going to be transporting these digested products to the blood or lymph. Fat is absorbed into lymph. Everything else goes into the bloodstream. Now, small intestines, remember, is the major site here. 90% of absorption occurs here. Digested foods enter the mucosal cells because, remember, back to those four digestive layers, the mucosa is the innermost, that's where the absorption takes place by either active or passive transport. Now defecation is the elimination of any indigestible uh, residuals. So it could be anything. It could be, you know, something indigestible or it could be, you know, something that you ate too much and so you don't need all of those. So you'll defecate that out as well. All right, so again, you can see all the steps here of digestion, ingestion, mechanical digestion, chemical digestion, propulsion, absorption, and then defecation. All right, the mouth, of course, is ingesting. This is where you start mechanical digestion with the mastication of chewing or chewing. Chemical digestion starts here because of the salivary amylase, which digests carbs, and a little bit of the lingual lipase for fats. You have the propulsion, the deglutition, the swallowing. We call this the buccal phase. This is voluntary. This is you swallowing, forcing the bolus into that oropharynx. But there's hardly any absorption here at all. Then you're into the pharynx and esophagus. Those are conduits. They're guiding or propulsing the food through. You have the deglutition, which is the pharyngeal esophageal phase. This is involuntary. This is once you have already swallowed the bolus, this is where peristalsis kicks in, and all routes except the desired one are blocked off. And of course, this will then continue through the rest of the GI tract. All right, in this picture, you can see, of course, the person swallowing up top and then what is happening in the GI tract. All right, so notice that the esophagus, that is that long tube leading to the stomach, it is not held open all the time. It's only open when food's moving through it. So it's literally, you're milking that food, flu, <laughs> excuse me, you're milking that food food down and it immediately closes right behind it which you can see in the bottom right hand pic picture as the food is moving through that gastroesophageal sphincter.